Good evening and welcome to Flashpoint. My name is Mark Green. Kevin McDonald is professor of psychology at Cal State University in Long Beach. His book, The Culture of Critique, is the third and most recent volume in a series on Judaism as a group evolutionary strategy. In his book, Professor McDonald describes how Jewish intellectuals have initiated and advanced important political and intellectual movements throughout the 20th century and beyond. More significantly, however, Professor McDonald claims that many of these same movements and the very science under which they were launched were covertly designed to advance specifically Jewish interests, often at the expense of larger non-Jewish populations. Professor McDonald? Glad to be here. Nice to see you. Yeah. Well, first, a scientific question. What is meant by group evolutionary strategy? Well, a, a, a group evolutionary strategy is basically a way for a group to get out of the world. And, um, and so when you study a group evolutionary strategy, you basically try to see how the group organizes itself, how it prevents uh, group members from, um, from uh, cheating, you know, doing things that, 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 the other, that, 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 that interfere with group interests. Mm -hmm. And um, how, for example, it, it prevents intermarriage, you know, so that it keeps the gene pool uh, pure, as it were. Mm -hmm. Uh, so those are the main things, and, and uh, to, to, for, for example, um, in speaking about Judaism, over the centuries, it's quite common for Jewish groups to, to, uh, to regulate the, the, the uh, business practices within the group and between Jews and non-Jews. Mm -hmm. So that would be a, a very important area for you know, maintaining their economic niche. Mm -hmm. And now as a concept of evolutionary strategy, that's part of uh, evolutionary psychology, which is the larger right. uh, scientific focus. But it's a widely accepted concept within the... Uh, I think evolutionary psychology is getting more and more um, acceptable within mainstream psychology now. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it intersects with my work. It's not the whole thing, certainly, but one, one of the things I'm interested in is what psychological mechanisms are involved in ethnocentrism and group identity and, and group conflict. I mean, I, I wrote in a, one, my second book was about anti-Semitism, so you want to know what psychological mechanisms are being triggered that result in between group conflict and those those are my, my view is that these mechanisms are evolved because we are not blank slates and mm -hmm. as we come into these uh, conflict situations with some very strong predispositions and that's why we see ethnic conflict uh, around the world today as we have throughout the past. So it's your opinion and others that were hardwired as it were to uh, have certain Proclivities? Well, uh, yeah, proclivities. I, I don't like to use the word hardwire because you know, there are certain environmental influences and there are mm. a lot of context effects and so on. But yes, we, we tend to uh, have negative attitudes towards our groups. Mm. Uh, we tend to you know, have more rapport and a sense of uh, common identity and um, comfort level, I think, with people of our own kind. Mm -hmm. And that's been. And that's universal, you think? Yes, I do believe it, yeah. And, uh, but I think some, some peoples are more ethnocentric than others. And you, is that what you call genetic similarity theory? Is that your theory? Is that why no, that, 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 that's, that's Phil Russian's theory, and he, mm -hmm. he's an evolutionary psychologist, and uh, his idea is that um, we, are, we are attracted to people who are like ourselves, mm -hmm. um, who have, have similar psychological traits, but also physical, you know, physical features and, and other uh, uh, attributes mm -hmm. that, that make us similar, and we have more rapport with them, um, we're more altruistic towards them and so on. And I think that's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, if people, especially when, when you have a, a group like the Jews, they're very, they've been together for so long and they have a, a common uh, you know, biological, you know, their, their, their uh, gene pool has been sort of segregated from the, from the surrounding society. They have a very strong psychological rapport with each other. Mm -hmm. And you see that over, you know, you're talking about these Jewish intellectual movements. So one of the basic features about those movements is simply the psychological rapport of the people at the center of those movements. In other words, the, the sense of comradeship, camaraderie, the sense of, uh, you know, I'll scratch your back, you scratch my back, mm -hmm. you know, sort of, you, you know, uh, sort of mutual uh, promotion and right. uh, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Well, I want to quote you. Uh, this is from the Culture Critique. You say, quote, Jewish intellectuals have developed intellectual movements that have subjected the institutions of Gentile society, that's non-Jews, of course, to, quote, radical forms of criticism. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, I, I think that um, one of the common denominators, of the, at least of the movements that I discuss in the Culture Critique, has been a, a sort of view that the surrounding culture, that, that, that the non-Jewish society uh, was in need of radical change, that it was fundamentally evil, as it were. I, I think, I think it, it derives from 
the, the fact that the Jews feel that they've been victimized mm -hmm. over the centuries. And it's like a huge chip on their shoulder, as it were. In other words, that they, if when, when, when um, someone who strongly identifies as a Jew, when they look back at history, they think of it as a series of persecutions. You know, you, when they think of the Middle Ages, they don't think of cathedrals and saints and pilgrimages. They think of, you know, crusaders killing Jews. They think mm -hmm. of persecutions. They think of the Inquisition. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when they think of, uh, of the Tsar, they don't think of, you know, palaces or, or whatever the good things that the Tsar did. Mm -hmm. They think of the anti-Jewish uh, laws of the late 19th mm -hmm. century, that sort of thing. And so there's, there's always this uh, sense that they've been victims mm -hmm. for the last 2,000 years in Christian society. And so, you know, th when, when they came to America, there was some anti-Jewish attitudes. And I think those attitudes were you know, fairly subtle by historical sense. We didn't have any pogroms, we didn't mm. killing Jews, but right. at the same time, uh, if Jews wanted to join a country club, they wanted to go to a hotel, maybe uh, there was sort of, you know, sort of subtle anti-Jewish attitudes, especially among sort of, well, I think it was pretty common mm. until, until after World War II, actually. Mm -hmm. But well, that, that uh, sort of thing was then, as soon as that happens, it's sort of put in the psychological bin of mm -hmm. this is the long, part of the long history of Western culture that culminated in the Holocaust. Well. Uh, they would naturally say, can you blame them? What, what do you well, say? Well, I think that's, that, that, that's a reason, you know, it's not mm -hmm. unreasonable. I think mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. um, it's understandable. And that's what I'm trying to say, that, that when you want to understand this, you have to understand the psychological mechanisms involved. Mm -hmm. And from their point of view, mm -hmm. you know, they, they see Western culture as an out-group culture. Mm -hmm. It is the culture of the other, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, uh, uh, they have a very positive attitude in general towards Judaism. And one of the things I try to do in the culture of critique. In every chapter where I claimed that there was a Jewish intellectual movement, uh, I think the first thing I had to establish was that, was that the people at the center of it were mm -hmm. strongly identified Jews. Mm -hmm. well, I, I want to ask you they right. took Jews very seriously. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to ask you now about those uh, numerous significant movements, to say the very least. Uh, but you, what do all these intellectual movements have in common besides Jewish leaders and uh, the Jewish core of disciples? Is that basically it right there? That, that is certainly a, a, an important that, that's, I think, the, base, the main mm -hmm, thing, mm -hmm. that, that, that you have the people at the center of the movement are strong identified Jews mm -hmm. who have a sense of pursuing specific uh, Jewish group interests. Mm -hmm. you know, for example, psychoanalysis, deeply concerned with anti-Semitism, wanting to eradicate anti-Semitism. Look at the Frankfurt School mm -hmm. and psychoanalysis, attempting to erect these psychological theories that any kind of prejudice against an outgroup like, like Jews was a, a pathology, mm -hmm. a psychiatric mm -hmm. disorder. But uh, you're leaving one other thing out too, and that is the role of deception. Well, uh, there, certainly there, there, was a, there was some of that. Um, uh, these, in general, these movements that were not advertised as Jewish movements. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were advertised in sort of universal terms. Mm -hmm. You think of, of leftist political ideology, or even psychoanalysis. There's nothing in psychoanalytic mm -hmm. theory that talks about Jews. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it, it's all you're ta talking about neuroses and this and that. But when it came to uh, understanding, you know, ethnic uh, hostility, mm -hmm. um, it was viewed as a pathology. Mm -hmm. But th there was no attempt to really understand Jewish ethnocentrism either. You so know, in other words, these in other words, uh, s psychoanalysis never uh, came up with a theory of Jewish ethnocentrism. The Jews were sort of outside the process. The attempt was to sort of put Western culture and um, people who had negative attitudes towards Jews, put them on the couch. Mm -hmm. to make them sort of the, the problem. So, so, so like Marxism, which we'll get to in a moment, the Jews were given sort of a privileged status, and whereas Christians were persecuted under the uh, communists, this is following the Russian Revolution, if I understand you correctly, uh, they accorded room for people to maintain a Jewish identity in post-revolutionary Russia, yeah, for instance, and elsewhere? Uh, yeah, actually, actually the, um, um, Marxism is very interesting from a, from a standpoint of the Jewish intellectual movement, because there's no part of Marxism that talks about Jews. I mean, it's universal. Mm. It's about class struggle. Um, and yet, in, in the post-Soviet Union, uh, it was, you know, the, 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 they, they came to grips with these various national groups, including Jews. So mm. Jews were allowed to keep their identity mm. in the post-Soviet world. And, of course, many did. I mean, when, you know, 40, 50 years later, when you started to have uh, people wanting to emigrate to Israel and so on, these people still had very strong Jewish identities. They, they didn't, you know, Jews didn't stop with the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. uh, far from it. But it always had this veneer of universalism. Mm -hmm. And so um, yeah, when, when, when Jews were the backbone of, of the American left, you know, it was 
uh, the official ideology was a universalist ideology. They never talked about their Jewish commitments. Uh, and uh, again, with, with, with leftism, there, there, there were specific Jewish interests, especially eradicating anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. That was, I mean, the, the Marxist ideology was mm -hmm. that once you got rid of all this class society, and you, uh, you, would, you would get rid of anti-Semitism, too. And I think also, you know, the, the fact is that, that Jews did see themselves as part of this managerial class that would manage the revolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they were in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So, the, yeah, one of the first things the Soviet Union did was, was outline the Semitism. Mm -hmm. And Jews formed a very elite group within the Soviet Union uh, until there started to be anti-Jewish sentiment that creeped to the surface, especially mm -hmm. after World War II. But until that time, Jews were certainly an elite in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, since you've written three books on the subject, I want to ask you a, a general question about yeah. Judaism. Now, is Judaism a religion as it's widely advertised, or is it a racial or ethnic identity? Uh, it's both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that sort of goes back to the first book I, I wrote on, on Jews called The People That Shall Dwell Alone, um, where I talk about uh, the fact that, that uh, if you look at, at the Jewish religion, it basically, one of the main things about it is that uh, it, there's an attempt to, to segregate the Jewish gene pool. In other words, to make sure that there are no out marriages and so on. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that was that was pursued. And so that when we do population genetic studies in the 20th century, and there have been an awful lot of them now, uh, there's no question that Jews are a unique gene pool. But it's very similar to Arabs still, or are they quite distinct even from Arabs? They, they, they are distinguishable from Arabs, but mm -hmm. if you look at what they're most similar to, they're most similar to the Palestinians, mm -hmm. ironically. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, when you talk about the conflict in the Middle East, you're not talking about a conflict between two very, you know, you know different peoples genetically, mm -hmm. but well, they have different group identities. Mm -hmm. Well, we're on the subject, I want to briefly make a distinction between what are Sephardic Jews versus Ashkenazi Jews, and I mean, you know, others have suggested that a large part of Ashkenazi Jews are actually people not from the Middle East at all, but people that converted at another time in history. Would you address some of those? Yeah, there, there are several different um, historical groups of Jews. The, the Sephardic Jews, uh, the Jews of Spain, mm -hmm. uh, the Ashkenazi Jews are the Jews of Europe, basically Eastern Europe, and then you have Oriental Jews that basically stayed in the Middle East, like Iraq and Babylon and mm -hmm. uh, areas like that. Um, the, the recent data suggests that uh, most of these groups started out with Jewish men, you know, uh, emigrating to like Spain and then um, and intermarrying with local women and then shutting down the intermarriage. So there was a, a brief period of intermarriage. Now those data are fairly recent. I'm not sure I, I believe them entirely. That was less true in Eastern Europe where there, there seems to have been more of an input of Jewish women that were brought along from, what the, you know, from the Middle Eastern gene pool. Um, but in, in, in all those cases, once they were established, they, they stopped the intermarriage. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a bottleneck there and they stayed within the group. What about the... Uh Black Jew experience. There are black Jews in Israel. Right? That's a, well. There are some now. They're, they're, these are Jews that that come from Africa. Uh, they are the result of Jewish traders, Jewish men, as I was saying, going down, intermarrying with some some of the local mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. There's also this this uh, Lemda tribe in the southern part of Africa, mm -hmm. and they are. You know, there's no question that if you look at the Y chromosome, it's the same as on the Cohen. The, you know, it's, it's the Jewish Y chromosome it goes right straight back to Moses mm -hmm. you know, and Aaron, uh, the high priest, and um, these are, are, they're black because, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're intermixed with Africans. Mm -hmm. um, these, these are not important groups of Jews, but now that when they have been brought over to Israel, you know, they, are, they, have, they have been accorded status as Jews. And what is their socioeconomic status in Israel? Well, there, it's, not, it's not high. And, and, and um, my understanding is there's quite a bit of social friction there. Mm -hmm. um, 